hello guys um welcome to my video so this is part two of uh the may june 2023 question paper one one and i'm going to be finishing off the paper um starting with question 11 up into question 40 so um please like comment uh share and subscribe okay so let's start off um we'll first start off with question 11. now the question reads the drive of a car applies two parallel forces so we have two forces that force and that force to a steering wheel as shown um, each force has a magnitude of 15 as you can see here um, and the steering wheel has a diameter of 0 0.40 what is the torque exerted on the steering wheel now the most important thing that you should be realizing is that we have um, what we call a couple okay so a couple generally refers to two forces that are about equal in magnitude okay um, and they are opposite in direction okay those forces are also forces of the same type but those are generally some of the properties that you should be looking for um, in a couple okay so from our question we're given that um, we have two forces this force and that force so they have to be parallel and they have to be acting in opposite directions so what we do is we resolve this into this component and resolve this into this component and this is the sine component of this one this is our hypotenuse so this will be 15 sine of 65 and we know that to find the torque is equal to the force multiplied by the distance and it's 15 sine of uh, 65 multiplied by the distance of 0.4 and um, we get an answer of approximately 5.4 uh, newton meters and our answer becomes d okay uh, moving on to question number 12 um, the question reads as follows a farmer is trying to lift the corner of a large water tank um, she uses a metal rod as a lever so we are given this metal rod um, that she is using as a lever the vertical force from the farmer is constant and is always applied at the end of the rod so the farmer is applying a force from this end and that force is always remaining constant which change must increase the upward force on the water tank so what is happening here is that a farmer is the farmer is pushing here and applying the force downwards this thing is moving upwards okay so as the farmer is applying the force down the object itself or the water tank itself rather is moving upwards so as the farmer applies this force um the question says we have to increase the force that is being exerted on this water tank what the farmer can do is they can increase this distance okay so if they increase this distance the force that they still apply which is constant here will cause a greater force to be applied here because they are applying an anti a clockwise moment on this side so there must be a greater anti-clockwise moment on the other side because they have increased this distance meaning that the moment the clockwise moment in this direction is greater that would also mean that this force is also greater so the farmer must use a longer rod meaning that c and d are already wrong because the roads are shorter and the block itself rather the pivot must also move um closer to uh, to the tank so the closer it is to the tank the longer this distance actually is if you move it here it doesn't make much difference because by increasing a longer rod and moving it further away from the tank you've done nothing so you need a longer rod and you need to move the pivot closer to the tank the answer becomes b okay moving on to question number 13 um, we're given a ball of weight w so this is our ball and is hanging in equilibrium from a string so it's attached to a string here that is that particular tension now the string is at an angle theta so this is our angle um and the ball is held by the uh from the wall by a horizontal force p from a metal rod now which relationship shows the magnitude of t p and w um that is correct so the first thing that you need to do here um, is you can see that you've been given a variety um, of different forces you've been given the tension um, you've been given p and you've also been given the weight w so what you need to do is you need to create a triangle so i'm going to be working through how we can be able to create that vector triangle so that you can be able to answer this question um, effectively so as you can see here we have this force that is acting in this direction this is the force p okay we have this force that is moving down 
this is the force w and we have this force that is acting in this direction which is our tension t now this angle theta is also the same angle theta that this force will be experiencing because they are z angles they are um opposite angles uh they are alternate angles uh, of between parallel lines meaning this is also the same angle theta now this is a right angle triangle because this is 90 degrees therefore it means that uh, the hypotenuse t squared will be equal to p squared um, plus w squared now if we were to look at trigonometry so as you can see um, we've already found our answer which is uh, c but i'm going to walk through why some of those answers are wrong now this is just a failed pythagorean theorem um, because we're supposed to square this for this to hold true meaning that b is wrong um, if you were to look at a let's look at the relationship um, between t as you can see this is the opposite side um, of this hypotenuse meaning that if we say uh, the hypotenuse um, the opposite side rather which is p divided by the hypotenuse which is t they should be equal to sine theta so p is equal to t sine theta and this makes a wrong because p is not equal to t cos theta p is equal to t sine theta and if we were to look at d they're saying w is equal to p tan theta that might be correct because w um let's see w is the adjacent and p is the opposite so p over w is equal to tan theta meaning p is equal to w tan theta no that's wrong meaning the correct answer becomes c okay moving on to question number 14 um, which expression for pressure is correct pressure is the force per unit area pressure is the force per unit area so the answer is a uh, moving on to question 15 a ball is a mass of 0 0.5 kgs and a volume of uh, 1.3 times 10 to the power of negative 3 the ball is floating uh, in equilibrium in still water the two forces acting on the ball are its weight and up thrust due to the water and um, we're given the density of water and we're asked to find the percentage of volume of water that is above the surface okay so this question has a lot that we need to unpack um the first important thing that you have to notice here is that we're given the weight and the up thrust right so it is important for you to see the following um whenever an object is in water um let's say we have this particular object which is um in water the up thrust will always act upwards very important meaning that the weight of the object will always act downwards now in this question the weight and the up thrust are equal because the weight and the up thrust one is acting up the other is acting down um so the mass that we have of the object has to be equivalent to this up thrust that is acting on the object so as an object moves down it displaces water because of pressure differences between the top and the bottom of the object we can see up thrust right but we know that up thrust is equals to the density times the gravitational acceleration times the velocity now we already know what the up thrust is going to be um, from our question okay so um, our up thrust is going to be um, 0 0.50 times 9.81 this is also equal to our weight okay so um, this is going to be 4.905 okay so it's very important for you to be uh, able to see that so this is the value of our up thrust and the question is asked us to find the percentage of the volume above the surface of the water okay so let's uh let's quickly walk through this um okay so since we're given um let's see so since we're given the up thrust we know that the up thrust is equals to rho gv okay um and then we're given the up thrust to be 4.905 the density um, is 1.03 times 10 to the power of 3 times 9.81 um, times V, the volume that we don't know. And once you find this volume, um, so our volume V will be 4.905, all of that divided by 1.03 times 10 uh, to the power of 3 times 9.81. And if you compute this, um, let's see, you get your value of volume to be 5 times 10 
to the power of negative 4. So this is the value of the volume of the water that has been displaced, or rather the value of the volume of the water that is um, below this object. So it's the volume, is this volume that we've just found to be 5 times 10 to the power of negative 4. And we want to find the percentage of the volume that is above the water. So what we're going to do is that we're going to, um, okay, so we're going to use this particular volume to find the volume of the water that is above, right? So if you find this as a percentage, um, we know that 5 times 10 to the power of negative 4 divided by 1.3 times 10 to the power of negative 3 times 100, um, because this is the total volume of the object itself, this will give us 38%. This means that this is 38% of the object. So what will be this? Okay, This will be 100 subtract 38. This will give us a total of 62%. Okay, so this whole question um, is really about us finding the percentage of the volume of water that is above the surface. Okay, So we have the mass, and we know that the weight and uprust are equal because they are the only two forces that are acting and this object is in equilibrium, okay? So we can equate the upthrust to the weight, and once the upthrust is equal to the weight, the density of water we have, um, the value of G we have, and we can find the value of volume that is causing that value of upthrust, which is 5 times 10 to the power of negative 4. And once we have that, we can divide by the total volume that we have of our object and to find the percentage of the water that is inside, which is 38%, meaning that this one will be 100 minus 38, which gives us an answer of 62 so our correct answer um, is C. Okay, uh, moving on to question number 16. A man sits on a bougie that is pulled along a wire. Okay, so this is a buggy, um, sorry, buggy, uh, that is pulled along a wire attached to a kite. The wire is at an angle of 40 degrees to the horizontal and it has this tension, and they travel a distance of 20 meters. What is the work done by the tension on the man and the bougie? So what is work done? Well, essentially, work done is the force times distance moved in the direction of the force, okay? So work done um, is the force times distance moved. But the force and the distance have to be acting in the same direction. Now we know that this man, let's assume he starts here and he moved to this point. We know that all of this is 20 meters. But we want to find the work done by the force, which is this tension. So we have to resolve the tension so that it faces in this direction so that this force and this distance are perpendicular. So how do we resolve? We know that this is the angle theta, and we want to find this value of angle. So we know that this is our adjacent. Um, this is our hypotenuse. So this will be uh, the hypotenuse cos theta. So this is 200 cos 40. So if you multiply these two, we get the value of the work done. So it's 200 cos 40 multiplied by a distance of 20 meters. This gives us a total of uh, three, uh, about 3,100 joules, which is approximately 3.1 kilojoules. So the correct answer is B. Moving on to question number 17. Um, a bow is thrown, moving on to question number 17, a bow is thrown vertically upwards. So you have to imagine this. You have your bow that is moving vertically upwards from the surface of the earth. This is your surface of the earth. We certainly describe the energies of the bow as it rises through the air. So the kinetic energy of the bow has to decrease and the gravitational or potential energy of the bow has to increase and your answer becomes B. But why is that? Well, as you project a bow upwards, the height has to increase. So this height edge has to keep on increasing as the bow moving upwards. But we know that the gravitational potential energy is equal to mg delta h. So if the height keeps on increasing, if it was once here, it reaches a higher height, which is h2, it means that the gravitational potential energy also has to increase because the height is increasing. So obviously that would make a wrong and that would make c wrong. So we also know that the total energy has to remain constant because we cannot create energy. So we cannot say that the total energy increases, but the kinetic energy has to decrease. Why is that? Well, if the weight continues to act downwards, um, rather, you know that the acceleration is going to be downwards, meaning that the object is going to reach a certain point where the velocity will be zero at the top. 
meaning that the kinetic energy of the object has been decreasing as it has been moving upwards. So our answer become B. Question 18. Um, we're given a lamp which is suspended in equilibrium from a fixed support by three long wires. Okay, so we have this wire, that wire, and that wire. The weight of each wire causes each uh, the weight of the lamp, sorry, causes each wire to have an extension of 0 0.40. The height h of uh, the lamp above the floor is measured. Okay, the middle wire then breaks and the lamp falls at a small distance as the extension remains constant. Um, what is the difference in the two values of the h? So after this, um, this wire, let's assume this wire breaks, means that the whole system is going to move downwards to this new position. So essentially what you want to find is the value of H that will be the height from the floor. So let's assume that this is the height from the floor, um, this particular height, maybe H, meaning that as it falls, the value of H is going to get smaller. So we want to find the difference between the height of that one and the height of that one. But you must know that if you find the extension that this wire is going to have um, after that wire is broken, if we subtract the two, we can find um, the total uh, difference in the extensions, and that becomes the differences in the height that we want to find. Okay, so let's go through that. Um, so let me try to represent this situation again. So it was like this, um, and we're given three wires that are hanging this lamppost, okay? So we're told that the extension already uh, is 0 0.40 uh, meters, right? So this is important to note that these are in parallel. Springs, rather, uh, these wires, these cables are in parallel. Now, if you quite don't understand this concept, I would recommend that you see my other videos that talk about springs in parallel and springs in series as we're going to be working through some of those facts. Uh, you can check them down in my channel below. So, but generally, we know that force is equals to uh, the spring constant multiplied by the extension. This is from Hooke's law. Now, consider the first scenario that the object is, at, uh, is as is, uh, it is. We want to find the value of the spring constant. Now, because there's three separate wires which are in parallel, they're all going to share the same force. Meaning that this wire is going to experience F over 3. That wire is going to experience F over 3. That wire is going to experience F over 3 because they're, it's generally the same wire. So because they're in parallel, they're going to share the force. So the force that it's going to experience will be F over 3, and we know that K will be that, and our spring, our extension is 0 0.04. So the value of K will be F um, over 1.2. You just multiply this uh, by that denominator, okay? So we get the value of 1.2. So this is my value of K, my, uh, my constant, rather, of the wire itself. So I want to find the new extension. So the wire, one of the wire breaks, meaning that I'll be left with this scenario here. Okay, so I now have two wires, but the force hasn't changed. The force acting downwards is still F, but these two are now sharing F over two, that one gets F over two. We know that F is equals to Kx, meaning that the force now is F over two, and the value of K is now f over 1.2, which is x. So if we say f over 2 divided by f over 1.2, this should be equal to our value of x, okay? So this will be, um, the value of x will be equal to 1.2 divided by 2, which will be equal to 0 0.60. So imagine this. This thing has extended more by how much? The total extension here um, that this is experiencing is 0 0.60, right? Meaning that this whole system has extended a certain distance that this system has not, because this one has a total extension of 0 0.60. Previously, we had an extension of 0 0.60. Meaning that this whole system has moved down by a difference of 0 0.20 meters. Meaning that that's the same distance that our system is going to change. So our answer, um, so our answer becomes A. As you have seen from all those calculations, that is, it falls down to a different height, the difference of this has to be 0 0.20. So that is the value that we'll be looking for, okay? Moving on, the force extension graph is given below. Um, what is, the represents the work done to extend the spring. So we have a certain spring that we have, okay? So in order to extend the spring, we have to apply a certain force downwards. So we know that that force is very proportional to the extension, 
meaning that the area underneath this graph has to represent that work done that is done. So the work done to extend the spring has to be the area under the graph, which is A. Okay, moving on to question number 20. In an experiment, a student uh, uses a microphone, okay, and a cathode ray oscilloscope, CRO, to analyze a sound wave. So we're given a trace on the screen of the CRO, and the student is painting a sinusoidal wave uh, form to be shown on the screen. Now we asked which change should the student make to the time base and the Y gain of the CRO, so the screen shows a continuous trace for one complete cycle of the waveform. So the very, uh, the, the, very impos uh, the very most important thing is to understand what is a time base and to understand what is a Y gain. So generally when you have a CRO, this is our Y gain, okay? And this is our time base, right? So our Y gain will be on that value and our time base will be on this value. The Y gain is given at times in volts per division, right? So we can say that this division maybe represents 5 volts. So it will be 5, 10, 15 as you go up. But this one represents time per division, right? So it can be milliseconds per division. So this division might represent 2 milliseconds per division. So if I have 10 of these, I have um, 20 milliseconds per division. But here, the student is not seeing the waveform itself, meaning that the wave is so much big than what it should be. So in order for the student to see, look at the Y gain. The student has to increase, um, the student has to increase the Y gain because they have to um, see more, thi uh, more things on this X axis and they also have to increase the Y gain. So let's assume that initially we have maybe five volts per division, okay? So in order for the student to see a lot of things on that same thing, each division has to represent many volts, right? So that we maintain the true meaning of the graph. So for it to be normal, for example, for it to be like this, it means that there has to be maybe 1,000 volts per division, right? There has to be maybe 1,000 volts per division. I'm just estimating numbers here, okay? Meaning that every division, if it holds 1,000 volts, I can see the whole wave and still maintain its true value. Because here it would mean that it needs so many boxes at 5 volts, it means about 200 boxes, which my screen does not have. But if I were to increase the Y gain, I can have a small wave that will be showing on my screen. The same with the time base. The time is so big that it, per, per division, it's maybe, maybe 10 milliseconds per division. But if I were to put maybe 1,000 milliseconds per division, means that one division can be able to show 1,000. So I've reduced my whole shape to be smaller. So my answer should be increase and increase. So the Y gain is this Y axis and the time base is this X axis. So this is measured in volts per division. If this increases, meaning my wave becomes smaller and I can be able to see my wave and it will be formed here because one division represents so much and it's appearing. One division again on the time base represents so much and my whole wave can be seen. Moving on to question uh, number 21. The diagram shows the variation of time and displacement. Two measurements, X and Y, are made. What do X and Y represent? Very important. So this value of X represents what we call the amplitude, which is the maximum displacement. Okay, so it's the maximum displacement from equilibrium position. So this will be maybe our equilibrium position. Um, and this becomes our amplitude. So C, uh, D is wrong and B is wrong, okay? And this Y, so it's very important with these graphs to read a graph. Whenever you see a graph, it's a high order question. So you have to read and understand the graph itself. So this is time, it's not distance. So this can't represent wavelength, right? This is not wavelength, but it is period because we're given time on this axis. But it's very important. A displacement time graph in waves represents one particle. Okay, so whenever you see a displacement particle, like they said, it's a particle. A displacement time graph studies one particle itself. How is that particle moving up and down? One particle can move up, can move down. But if it's a displacement distance graph, okay, it studies the whole particles themselves. This is an individual particle, individual particle, individual particle, individual particle along the whole wire itself. But for displacement time graph, I'll just be looking at the motion of this particle 
on its own this becomes a different displacement time graph this becomes a different displacement time graph so it's very important for you to know that but our answer uh, is a moving on to question number 22 okay this is the doppler effect uh, question so we're given a car traveling at a constant speed and the loudspeaker is attached to the car emitting a constant frequency f and we're given a stationary observer who is at point o okay so this stationary uh, observer here like wants to listen to some music that is coming from this car okay so how is the observer going to hear this music maybe he's listening to some um some music and the observer has to hear some variations of that music so the frequency can be more or less so that's what we have to look at so this car is moving towards the observer O, right so our frequency has to be higher initially right because as you move towards an observer you have to have a high frequency that is more than f because if you have f let's say f is our fs as you move towards this you're supposed to be moving at the velocity that is at a, uh, you're supposed to be having um an observed uh frequency that is greater than the constant frequency f okay but why is that because if this car moves the waves are being swashed up in front of the car okay but the waves at the back are being spread apart right so this whole effect causes the doppler effect so if these waves are getting spread and spread and spread and spread the frequency has to be more than f to begin with because it's it's already swashed up and we know that if wavelength um rather we know that if wavelength decreases so this is our wavelength if it decreases the frequency has to increase right because v is equals to f lambda very important so frequency and wavelength are directly inversely proportional so if the wavelength is decreasing here this is our wavelength if it's decreasing it means that the frequency has to be more than f meaning a and b are wrong but that frequency decreases as the car moves from p towards q why is that well this is very tricky um because um the way i looked at this is that if you are at q at this point q right um the observer and the source are directly in line with with each other meaning that the waves are neither being swashed nor being compressed because it is exactly in line with this observer they will be emitted at the exact frequency that is the frequency f okay so these waves will reach this observer as normally as they would but as the car moves past q they start getting spread apart uh, in that direction so q and o they're just at different positions but they should experience the same effect because the wave generally travels in a variety of di directions right so if you're at q you're supposed to be experiencing fs temporarily you're supposed to be experiencing that constant frequency f when you are at q which should be the same when you're at o because the waves are neither being swashed nor compressed so the frequency is the same but here the frequency was higher but it decreased the moment it arrived at q so that frequency which was more than f decreases as that value uh, of p moved towards q very tricky um, if you have another, any other method to work this out please share in the comment section below but um the other method that you could look at this is to consider the components of velocities but it's rather complicated because you'll be looking at the component of velocity in this direction right so this will be let's say maybe v cos theta right in this direction meaning that if you move to this angle this value of v cos theta is also right the angle theta is increasing and we know that if theta increases very much, uh, the cos theta starts to fall, meaning that v cos theta falls and our frequency also continues to decrease. But that's a lot of complicated thing to consider about our angles. But just remember this, as you are at the observer Q here, the waves should be emitted the same because you're neither being swashed nor compressed. Meaning that if it was more before Q, it has decreased to that same frequency F meaning that there has been a decrease in that frequency as you have arrived at the point Q. So it was, but it was very uh, tricky. It was not quite clear. Okay, so moving on to question 23. Some sources of electromagnetic waves are given. So we're given a radio, um, we're given x-rays, we're given um, 30 millimeters, and we're given red light, right? And we're asked to list them in order of increasing wavelengths. So I'm not going to talk much about the wavelength themselves, um, but what you should know is that we have this abbreviation, uh, okay, 
here. So as we move from this to here, the wavelength itself um, decreases. So as you move from radio waves to gamma waves, the wavelength has to increase. Now we're given x-rays, so um, it has to decrease, sorry. So we're given um, x-rays, so we know that x-rays are here, right? So they have to have the smallest wavelengths amongst everything else because we're given visible light. Radio light is part of the visible light. Remember, Roy, G, Biv, meaning that red light is also part of visible light here. So this has to be again at a higher wavelength than this lambda. So you have you have to first start with a two, right? A two here, a two here, means A and D are already wrong, okay? Then you have to move to a four, which is the red light, okay? So you move to a four here, you move to a four here. So now it's about three and one, okay? So one is a radio wave. The radio wave is here. So generally the radio wave is from around 10 to the power of six to one, but there, there are a lot of textbooks that say a lot of different things. But I would advise you with these ranges, you have to know them by heart, but just find a method that's flexible for you. Find a way to memorize all these numbers. For example, visible light, but 400 to 700 are nanometers. Gamma rays, 10 to the power of negative 11 to 10 to the power of negative 14 or 16. There are a lot of textbooks that say a lot of things, but they usually give ranges with these kind of questions. So it's very important for you to be able to just memorize it in a way that you can understand. So... Um, that would mean that 3 has to be smaller because obviously radio waves are much bigger than 0 0.03 because this is 30 millimeters, right? So they have 30 millimeters divided by 1,000. So it has to be much bigger than that. So our answer becomes C. Okay, moving on to question 24. We're given a vertically polarized um, light beam of uh, that is incident normally on a polarizing filter. So we are asked to find the ratio of the amplitude of the transmitted beam. This is our transmitted uh, beam and the amplitude of the incident beam. So this is what we are. Uh, this is where we apply the new addition to our syllabus, which we call Malice's law. OK, so Malice's law says that the intensity that you get for your transmitted uh, beam is equivalent to the initial intensity cos squared of theta. So Malice figured out that if you have a uh, certain light that you're transmitting through this polarizing filter that has been filtered previously, um, the angle between that polarized filter and the polarizing filter, that would be the second one, rather, which is the analyzer. So this is our analyzer. The angle between the polarizing filter and the analyzer has to be um, theta. And this particular value of theta, therefore, is the one that you put in this particular um, equation. But we're told that this light is vertically polarized. So as this is coming here, it's vertically polarized like that. So the trick with Malice's law, where most people find difficulty, is in identifying this angle theta. So this question was particularly tricky on that aspect itself. But it's, it's not very difficult. But what you have to do is you have to draw what we call axes, um, rather with this axis, of transmission, right? So we already have it, which is in this particular angle. Right? So your polarizing filter has been shifted to look in that particular angle. But your light initially is vertically polarized, meaning that your light is coming like this, okay? If we were to exaggerate it a bit. So we want to find this angle theta. But the question has already given us 40 degrees, right? But we want to find this angle theta. So this is our polarized light, okay? And this is our transmitted transmission axis. So the angle theta is the angle between the transmission axis of the polarizing filter and the theta and, uh, and the transmission axis of the polarized light that is coming itself. So the we have a polarizer that will be here. So the difference between these angles, the how this is positioned and how this polarizing filter is also positioned, that angle theta becomes the angle that we're interested in. Okay. So how do you find the ratio of the amplitude? Very easy. We know that um, amplitude intensity is equal to Ka squared, right? Intensity is directly proportional to amplitude squared, okay? So if we have this particular question here, and we want to find the ratio of the amplitude itself, like I have already said, this angle is supposed to be um, 90 minus 40, which is 50 degrees. Remember, this is a 90 degree angle. If this is 40, that has to be 50 degrees, obviously. So 
our amplitude, right? This is intensity of transmitted beam. Remember that the uh, transmitted beam will be, so let's, let's look at this. Um, so I, right? So I um, is equals to K, okay? A squared, right? But we want to find the transmitted beam, which is I naught cos squared, um, this is 50 degrees. That is also equal to K A T squared, right? This is A for transmitted, and this is I for incident. Meaning that the amplitudes here will be the square root of all these values, right? So the ratio of the amplitude of the transmitted over the amplitude of the incident should be equal to the square root of, right? Uh, cos squared of 50, right? Divided by um, I, so it's I here, I naught, divided by this value of I, right? This is also I naught here. So these two angles are going to cancel out, right? So we just want to find this ratio of the amplitude and the ratio of that amplitude. So we're left with the square root of cos squared um, of 50. So if we were to punch this on our calculator, um, this will give us an answer of approximately 0 0.64, right? So it's very important for you to uh, to picture this and imagine this. It's a bit complicated, um, but you have to know this equation, very important equation. And once you know this equation, you know that this angle theta is the angle between the polarized light itself, the incident uh, light, and it has to also be from the transmission axis. So your theta becomes 50 degrees, right? And once you have that angle theta, you can then use the ratios that this intensity is equal to that intensity and you create an inequality. The val all the k's will cancel out. There was a k here and the k there, they all canceled out. So we'll be left with only the amplitude on the po top point and the amplitude at the bottom point. And um, if you divide the square root of cos squared of 50, you get uh, 0 0.64 and our answer um, is C. Moving on to question number 25. We're given two progressive waves that are meeting at a point. Which condition must be met for superposition to occur? Now, there's a difference that you need to understand. There's a difference between stationary wave formation, okay, conditions for forming a stationary wave, and conditions for superposition, right? Very important for you to understand this. So for a stationary wave, there are certain conditions that we need. We need waves that are traveling at the same speed, okay? So if waves are traveling at the same speed, um, and they're traveling in opposite directions, right, um, and they're of the same type, right? Same speed, traveling in opposite direction, same frequency, um, same amplitude, the waves can form a stationary wave. But for superposition, the waves um, can meet out of phase, that is destructive um, interference, or they can meet in phase, that is constructive interference. So we have to understand this. For, condition, for superposition to occur, the waves have to be of the same type. It can't make sense that a transverse wave, okay, and a longitudinal wave, right? These are two waves which are not of the same type. A transverse wave and a longitudinal wave can form superposition. Superposition is when waves add up. The resultant displacement is the vector sum of individual displacements. We know that the transverse wave displaces in a perpendicular direction. A direction. A longitudinal wave displaces in a parallel direction. Those two can never superimpose in any way. They can never have superposition, right? Waves can meet out of phase. One can be um, um, out of, for example, a crest and meeting a wave that is a crest meeting with a trough of another wave. These two waves are out of phase. They just cancel out and we have destructive interference occurring, right? The waves must be traveling in opposite directions. Well, if waves meet at a point, they obviously have to be tra uh, traveling in opposite directions, right? So we have to be thinking about this um, much more of what is more important, right? Because waves have to be of the same type. Two waves of different types can't superimpose, right? For coherence, well, they can have, it can form, but it's quite diff different because it's much more a condition for interference itself to occur. But for superposition to occur, for two waves to add up, they definitely have to be of the same type, right? But it's very tricky because some of these answers might be true, but this is something that is undebatable that they have to be of the same type. A transverse wave and a longitudinal wave can never superimpose 
under any circumstance so the answer becomes b so we're told that the uh the generator is vibrating at a frequency f and we have a node that is formed here so this is a node a node a node a node and a node over here okay so we're told that uh, we have five nodes so one two three four five okay we're told that there's a node at the end of the string that is attached to the vibrator generator we've put that node the frequency of the generator is slowly increased so it's very important for you to understand what it means to increase the frequency okay so if we're increasing the frequency it means that the wavelength is decreasing generally if frequency increases lambda has to decrease the wavelength itself has to decrease because the frequency has increased right but we know that these are different ways that have been put together right we know that from a node to another node, okay, this corresponds to a distance of lambda, right? If you have a wave that is having one node, okay, so let's put a wave here that has this and this. This is a fundamental wave. We know that this will be a node here and this will be a node here. This represents lambda over 2. And this becomes lambda is equals to 2 times the length that is already there. This wave already has a very long wavelength because we're not even seeing the full form of the wave itself. For it to be a full wavelength, it's actually lambda for two. For it to be a full wavelength, it needs to be something like this, okay? But if we make it bigger, if we add another loop, the effect of this is it affects the length that is there. For example, from a node to a node, lambda is equal to L, right? So the more nodes that you keep on adding, the less your lambda becomes. Because you're swashing up so many waves in a very short distance, right? It becomes so crowded. Because if you were to put three loops like here, you have almost the whole wave swashed up into three loops. If you were to put a lot of waves, like maybe five different waves here, you're swashing so many waves together. And if waves become swashed together, you can assume that the wavelength has to decrease. Here they were a bit spaced out. Here they're far spaced out. So as we were adding nodes, as you keep on adding nodes, you keep on in decreasing the wavelength. Very important fact to know. So whenever you see the word frequency is increased and you always see loops that are formed, if you were to decrease your wavelength, you have to add another loop here, right? So by adding another loop, it means that we have um, increased the wavelength of the wave that we want. So let's look at the question itself, right? So we know that the distance from this is lambda. So the distance from that again, um, from, from this point, okay? So from this point to that point, um, so from this point, that point is lambda. So from this point, that point is also lambda. So from this point, to the point that we have added is half lambda. Because we want the next frequency, that is exactly next. So we only add one, one loop. We can add another loop for the other subsequent um, crest that will form. Okay, so we know that 2 lambda before our uh, 2 lambda was equivalent to L, right? This whole length was L and 2 of those that we had was equivalent to L. Meaning that our frequency was equivalent, right, to V over lambda. It was equivalent to um, 2V over L, right? Because our lambda is L over 2, right? So our initial frequency was F, which is equals to 2V over L. Right? This was our initial frequency, and we want to find the next frequency in terms of f. So, like I said, I've added another loop, meaning I now have two and a half, right? So this is our first part. I now have two and a half lambda. So it's now two and a half lambda is equal to L. Therefore, your lambda is equal to, um, if you carry it to the other side, it becomes two, okay, over five um, of L, right? So 2 over 5 of this particular value of L is now your new lambda, right? So your whole lambda is fitting in a distance of 2L. 2 over 5 of that length. That's a very small distance. Here, our, our lambda was fitting in L over 2, which is quite big. So our lambda was big. So now it's fitting over 2 over 5 of the length, meaning that this wavelength is actually decreased, right? And we know that V, 
like like we have said, we know that V is equals to okay, um V F sorry is equals to V over lambda, right? So our lambda is now two over five, therefore our F okay is now equal to um five V essentially because it's uh it's two over five here, okay? So it's two over five L, um and V here, meaning that it now has to flip up, so it becomes five V divided by two of L. Okay, so this is essentially our new wavelength. And we want just to express this in terms of F. This is our value of F. We just want to express this in terms of F, right? So we know that V over L, V over L from here, F over two, we divide both sides by two, is equals to V over L. So we can remove V over L in this equation. Therefore, F is five over two, V over L, which is F over two. Therefore, F, okay, um, will be equal to 5 over 4 of the small letter f, which is 1.25f. So our answer becomes a. Right? So our answer um, becomes a. So it's very important for you to understand this. By increasing the frequency, I have to add another, uh, another node. So I'm compressing my wavelength because I'm forcing the wave to be so much smaller by increasing those subsequent nodes. If the question had said decreased, I would have removed one loop from the question. So I would have removed maybe this loop, right? And I'll be left with three loops and I wake it in that direction. Very important. Moving on to question number 27. We're given a ripple tank um, and a barrier with a single gap. So this is our gap, okay? Um, and we want to increase the amount of diffraction, uh, diffraction observed. But we're told that the wavelength of the ripples is five times smaller than the gap in the barrier. So for diff diffraction means that the wave is spreading into the geometrical shadow, right? So a wave will come here and it will spread out as it reaches this particular gap, right? The wave spreads out. So in order for diffraction to occur, remember, the, man the maximum amount of diffraction, right? The amount of diffraction depends, okay? The amount of diffraction that you have, oh, sorry, the amount of diffraction that you have depends on the wavelength, right? So the wavelength that you have detects the amount of diffraction that you have. If the wavelength, um, rather, okay, so, so think about this. The wavelength is related to the gap, right? So if the gap is very small, or rather the, if the gap and the wavelength are identical, I have the greatest amount of diffraction. If the gap is too big than the wavelength, right? It means that I have very little diffraction because the wavelength is so small. It's not diffracted that much or the gap is too big, right? So the wavelength and the gap have to be just the same for you to have the greatest amount of diffraction. But initially, the wavelength is five times smaller. So we want to increase the wavelength so at least it matches the gap itself. So doubling the, the, the amplitude has no effect on the wavelength. They have no relationship, right? The wavelength is this. The amplitude is this. They're perpendicular to each other. No effect. If we double the width, we're actually increasing the gap itself, right? If we double the gap, we're actually increasing it itself. If we halve the wavelength, remember I said that the wavelength and the gap must almost be the same, right? But I know that f is equals to v lambda. Therefore, f is inversely proportional to lambda, right? So if I half the frequency, it means I have to also double the wavelength, right? So my wavelength is now being doubled meaning I have now a great amount of diffraction because my wavelength and my gap are almost identical. Very important. So remember, the wavelength and the gap, um, so remember, the wavelength and the gap are related. If they are close to each other, the amount of diffraction is greater. If the wavelength is too small than the gap, very little diffraction occurs. Moving on to question 28, um, we're given a laser of uh, which produces a beam of light of 650 newtons, okay? So it's incident on two slits, so it's like this, uh, two slits here, and we're given like this, this is our beam, right? So we'll have a bit of um, interference occurring, okay? Very important. So we're told that this is a value of A, and this is a value of D. This is where we form a bright fringe, and another bright fringe, that will be the value of X, right? We know that lambda is equivalent to AX, over D, very important fact. And we want to find the distance between the screen and the two slits, which is value of D. So D is equals to AX over lambda. So do we have A, do we have X, do we have lambda? If you substitute them, you get the value of D. 
But important for you to remember, the unit's conversions are very important. They must all be in meters for everything to make sense. My value of A is um, 0 0.12, okay? So 0 0.12 times 10 to the power of negative 3. My value of X is 7.5 times 10 to the power of negative 2. I divide by my lambda, which is 650 times 10 to the power of negative 9, okay? Um, so if I, to com uh, if I compute this... Um, Okay. I get um, a value of approximately um, 14 meters. So remember, okay. you have to look at your value of D, you have to look at the whole equation and how the equation fits and calculate the value of D, right? So it can give you a lot of things, um, very important. Moving on to question 29, we're given um, a beam of light from a laser that is incident on a diffraction grating. Um, so whenever you see the word grating, what should come to mind is one equation only. D sine theta is equivalent to N lambda, right? This is the whole equation that is linked to this word, right? The word grating, that equation should be coming into mind. So you have to use that equation somehow, right? It depends on the question itself, but the word grating is very important. But what, do, what does N mean? N refers to the order, right? So this is the order. Lambda is your wavelength. D is the value between uh, the, the two different slits, right? So it's the line spacing itself. You should know that D is also equivalent to 1 over N, right? So how many values, how many uh, millimeters do you have? You might have 600 lines per millimeter. So you can find the value of D, the distance between two lines, right? So using this equation, we know that lambda, right, is equals to d sine theta um, over n, right? But the most tricky thing is what is the value of theta? Theta is not 110, right? The value of theta is from the central fringe, will be here where we have a zero, right? Or rather, this n is equals to zero order, and this one, right? So this is n is equals to zero, right? And we're told that this is n is equals to 2, meaning we have n is equals to 1. We also have n is equals to 1 here, and n is equals to 2. The theta is always the angle between the central order, which is n is equals to 0, and wherever you want to go, right? You can go here, value of theta. You can go here in this angle, value of theta. So your value of theta is not 110. Rather, it is half of this, um, which is 55. So your value of d will be equivalent to um, 1.0, times 10 to the power of negative 6, times sine of 55, divided by a value of n, which is 2, you get approximately 4.09 times 10 to the power of negative 7, which is 4.1 times 10 to the power of negative 7. Your answer is A. Question 30. The electrical current is 4.0 milliamps. How many electrons pass a fixed point in a time of 10 hours? What is current? Current is the rate of flow of charge carriers. So charge carriers can be electrons, right? So as electrons are flowing, the goal of electrons is to transfer charge from point A to point B, right? But the rate at which they're flowing is what we call current, right? So if they're flowing very fast, it means that we have so much current that is flowing through the circuit. If they're flowing very slow, it means we have very little current that is flowing. Time determines the amount of electron that passes a fixed point. So if we look at this point, if five electrons pass, that has an effect on the current itself. If five electrons passes in a period of 10 hours, that has an effect on the current. It tells me something about the current. So whenever you see these kind of quantities, you should think of one equation only, right? So Q is equals to NE, which is equals to IT. Q is the elementary charge, right? So the value of n is the number of electrons. So this is the number of electrons, right? This is your elementary charge, and this is i, this is t. The total charge that are there, since each electron has an elementary charge, if there are a million electrons times the elementary charge, that is the overall charge that you have. And that is equivalent to the product of current times time, right? So if you remember this equation, and you can apply it in any scenario, whenever you see the word number of electrons, think of that equation. You ever see, uh, whenever you see the word current and time, 
think of how all of those are connected. So we want to find the number of electrons. If we rearrange this, we know that Ne is equal to I times T. Therefore, N is equal to IT divided by E, right? So they give us this in milli. Remember unit conversions, 4.0 times 10 to the power of negative 3 times um, 10 times 3,600 divided by 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19. I've converted hours to seconds, um, so that gives us n is 9.0 times 10 to the power of 20, which is c. Question 31, um, what is the definition of potential difference across a component? So basically, potential difference is the energy transferred per unit charge. So I'm going to give you an illustration of what potential difference is and what EMF is, right? So I want you to consider a cell that you have here, right? So this particular cell has EMF in the battery. So EMF is here in the battery, and this is your potential difference. So I want you to imagine that electrons are coming out of, um, are electrons are already in the wire itself. The battery is not a source of electrons. What the battery does is just it pumps electrons to move across the circuit. Imagine a water pump. A water pump is not a source of water. It just pumps water from one point to another. That is what the battery exactly just does. So the battery has certain energy that it has that it stores in here. Every battery has some energy, right? And the potential difference is different from the EMF. So imagine an electron that's coming here. As the electron passes through here, it is given a portion of some energy. So this electron has certain energy that it has. It moves with that energy. It moves with that energy and it deposits that energy here. That is electro energy that is converted into kinetic energy. Sorry, that is electro energy converted into heat uh, or light. You can see a light bulb turning on. And as the electron reaches this point, it has nothing, right? It goes back here. It gets a refill. It gets more, 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 more energy. And it moves. So it's non-electrical to electrical. And it moves around the component itself. It goes through the component. It deposits that energy. And it gets back into non-electrical, right? So imagine a truck, for example, that has come to a certain area. Right? And the truck is giving people maybe bags of, of, uh, of maize meal or bags of rice or some, something like that. So these electrons represent people who get a bag of maize meal here. They move with that bag of rice or maize meal and then they reach here. They deposit that bag at their house. They come back without anything at all. They go back, they get another thing. So the EMF keeps on uploading. It acts at the truck itself with these different bags. It keeps on giving these electrons bags of rice. The electrons deposit it. They give the bags of rice, the electron deposits it. So the amount of energy, the joules itself, might be, if a battery is rated 9 volts, meaning that it gives 9 joules for every electron that comes through it, uh, through the battery itself, right? And the potential difference now is energy transferred from electrical to non-electrical. It's energy that, the bat, uh, that these electrons deposit over here. So it's the energy converted from electrical to non-electrical. So it's the energy transferred per unit charge from... Um, electrical, okay, to non-electrical. So it's very important for you to understand what EMF actually is. It's the energy that a battery gives to every unit of charge, from non-electrical to electrical. Potential difference is the difference between two points, right? The energy that a, a circuit, or rather the electric, sorry, the energy that an electron has deposited into a particular component. Moving on to question 32. Um, the IV characteristic of filament lamp uh, is D because it has to be like this. Um, if it's almost like this, it becomes a semiconductor diode. So A is not. Um, I is a metallic conductor. Uh, so I and V uh, for B is a metallic conductor. Uh, so it's not. So our answer has to be uh, D. Moving on to question 33. The wire has length 2.50 meters and we have this certain cross-sectional area. We're given the resistivity of the metal. So the resistivity is the property that a metal has. It's always constant. The wire is stretched so that its length increases to 2.6. So we have this wire, right, with length of 2.50. So now it's stretched, it's longer, and its length is now 2.65, okay? Very important. Um, so the volume is remaining constant. What is the change in the resistance of the wire? Right, we know that resistance is equals to rho L over A, right? So I need to find the length, the area, and the resistivity. I already have all of those. 
um, and I find the resistance when the length is uh, 2.5. And then I'll find the resistance when the length is uh, 2.65. Then I just subtract the two. I get my change in resistance, okay? So let's work this out. So initially, I'm given wire, um, wire R, right? So I want to find the initial one, right? I've said that it's rho L divided by A, right? So my value of R, the resistivity is 3.50 times 10 to the power of negative 7 times my length which is 2.50 divided by 4.50 um, times 10 to the power of negative 6 right so this is my value of my resistivity and i want to find this so if you compute this i've substituted the value of rho uh the resistivity l and a and i've gotten this so my value of r will be 0 0.194 so when my length um, ohms. So when my length is 2.50 and this area, this value of A is this value, I'm getting this resistance, right? So this is my first answer. I move on to my second scenario. The wire has been stretched, okay, into 2.65. But I've been told by this question that the volume remains constant. Very important. The volume remains constant, right? But we know that volume is equal to area times length. Okay. If volume remains constant, it means that the volume that the wire initially had is the same as the volume that it now has, right? But what was the volume initially? Before, it was the area of 4.50 times 10 to the power of negative 6 times 2.50. And we were given um, the volume here to be 1.125 times 10 to the power of negative 5 right? So previously, this was my volume. But now I've increased this length, meaning this L has gotten bigger. So this A has to change somehow for the volume to remain constant, right? So my value of A will now be, so let's compute this, A is equals to um, 1.125 times 10 to the power of negative 5, um, my A, divided by well, this is my volume divided by my length, which is 2.65. I get a new area, A2, which is 4.25 times 10 to the power of negative 6. So this is my new area. So I now have to calculate my second resistance, first resistance, second resistance, right? So I get the area of 2.65 times 3.50 times 10 to the power of negative 7. I divide by my volume of 4.25 times 10 to the power of negative 6, and I should get an answer of 0 0.218, right? So this is my second resistance. This is my first resistance. So the difference here will be equivalent to the actual difference, which is 0 0.218, subtract 0 0.194. This gives me a total of 0 0.024 ohms. So very important, remember, Find the resistance first. You have that resistance. Don't always assume that applying the same equation, the area is always constant. Try to find what the question is telling you. Volume is constant. What do you know about volume? Volume is area times length. Find the new area. Once you have that area, you have the new length. Find the second resistance. Subtract the two and you get the difference. Okay, so our answer becomes B. Uh, moving on to question 20, uh, 34, we're given which circuit symbol represents a microphone, right? So the answer is C. Now, I'm going to attach, like as you've seen on the side of the screen, I've shown different circuit symbols that you might want to know. Um, for example, what this means and that, what, what that means, you can see it from the side. So it's very important for you to be familiar with a lot of things in physics. Look, as, look at many circuit diagrams as you can see, right? These, you might not even find it in a test book. So be open-minded, look at different questions, um, look at different sources, for example, look at different components from the internet. I've attached only a few here, but there's so many components that you know. This is only one mark, but it's very important um, to know these, con uh, these concepts. Okay, moving on to question 35. We're given a battery that is internal resistance and is connected to a fixed resistor. An ammeter and a voltmeter as shown. The battery is replaced by a different battery that is the same EMF, right? Remember what EMF is? The, for, uh, the energy that is given to each electron as it begins to move, right? But it's a greater internal resistance. 
what happens to the readings on the ammeter and the voltmeter. So I'm going to be explaining what internal resistance actually is. Now, every battery has a source of resistance, right? A battery has different chemicals that are within the battery itself. That probably means that a battery has some resistance. If an electron enters into the battery, right, it's going to experience some resistance and it's going to come out with less energy because it has used some of that energy in overcoming the internal resistance. To make this representation a bit easier, we just normally put a little resistor here that represents that internal resistance. But it's, think about this. If you increase the resistance, you have a greater resistance, you know that V is equal to IR, right? If this remains constant, right, the total resistance, the EMF is equal to the total current, right, um, and the total resistance that will be here, right? So your value of EMF is somehow constant, meaning that your current is inversely proportional to 1 over RT. As you increase the internal resistance, as this value increases, right, as that value of the internal resistance increases, it means somehow there's an effect on the total current, right? If total resistance increases, total current has to decrease, right? So if current decreases, because resistance has increased so much, the current has to decrease, the ammeter reading also decreases, right? So the ammeter reading has to be less than what previously was. So C is wrong, D is wrong. But the battery loses, uh, sorry, the electron loses energy in overcoming internal resistance, meaning that this voltmeter reading, this is my V terminal, um, becomes less, right? The terminal velocity, sorry, sorry, uh, the terminal voltage becomes less, right? Because some of the voltage has been lost here. We call them V lost as lost volts have been lost in the internal resistance. So it's now less when it becomes the terminal velocity. So the voltmeter reading has to drop to show that that reading has changed. So my answer becomes B because the voltmeter reading has decreased, right? Imagine our example, the example that I gave about the tractor in terms of EMF that gives bags of rice. Imagine that there are people that are at that tractor itself, right? Or at that lorry itself that want the rice that you're being given. You'll be forced to give them some of the bags that you have. So by the time you reach your house, by the time that electron reaches its house, it has very few bags. Maybe it has two bags of rice, right? The person has two bags of rice, and that is what they deposit on the bag because they've given that bag of rice to something else which was already in the battery itself, already at the lorry. So think about this. In internal resistance, every electron already gives out something else, meaning that it would be already less by the time it reaches this component, the V terminal will be less. Okay, moving on to question 36. Um, we're almost done. We're left with four questions, I think. Um, we're given four potential dividers, uh, circuits of EMF9. So it's 9999 nine, nine, nine there, okay? And negligible internal resistance combined, connected to a combination of resistors. We're given each of the resistors that have a resistance of X or 2X. We are asked, which circuit has the largest output voltage? I would advise you to do the following. Whenever you see questions with X, X, and Vs, a lot of unknown variables, try to change them to something that you know. For example, let X represent 2 ohms, right? So this X will be 2 ohms, and this X will be 2 ohms, this X will be 2 ohms, and that will be 4, right? Because it's 2 times 2, right? And um, this will also be 2, and that will be 2, that will be 2, that will be 4, and that would also be um, 2, and that would also be 4, right? So you have changed everything around, but what are we supposed to find? We're supposed to find the circuit that gives the largest output voltage. So you apply what we call the potential divider rule. Let's first start with A, right? Let's look at A here. So we're given 2 and 2 here. The potential divider rule says that. The resistance through a certain component divided by, let's say, R1 plus R2 times the total voltage becomes the voltage across that resistor itself. So you have two resistors that are connected in series. The first one gets something based on the ratio of their resistances themselves. So R1 divided by the total of those two resistances times the value of V becomes what you need to compute. So imagine this one. It's 2 divided by 2 plus 2, right? So it becomes 2 
over 4 times 9, this gives you a total value of 4.5 volts, right? Very important. Um, we'll move on to the second one, okay? First, uh, we have 2, okay? So here we have um, a total value of 2. Uh, so 2 um, plus 4, which is 6. So this one gets 4 um, divided by 6 multiplied by 9. This gives us a total of 6 volts, okay? That's much higher than A, meaning that A has to be wrong because that value is much higher, okay? So A is wrong. Um, we're going to part C. So we're given 2 and 4. Right, so we can apply parallel connection here, right? So we can find the total resistance, which will be two times uh, four over two plus four. Right, so that's a total of four um, over three, right? So here we have a total of four over three, that is here, right? And here we have a total of four over three plus two. Right? So we have a total of 10 over 3. So this one will get 4 over 3, okay, divided by 10 over 3 of 9 uh, volts of energy. So here we'll have 3.6 volts. This is already less uh, than that one which we have obtained. Um, and if we were to move to our last, last one, um, this, sorry, um, this is 2, okay, uh, 2 here, which is the total here. Um, Okay, uh, it's not 2, um, it's 4, okay, so it's 4 plus 2, uh, 4 times uh, 2 over 2 plus 4, which is still the same thing, okay, so it's 2 over 4, um, right, over 3 plus 2, which is 2 over 10 over 3 times 9, which is 5.4, way less than D, so our answer, way less than B, sorry, so our answer becomes uh, D. Right, very important. Moving on to question 37. Um, we are, we're told that a voltmeter is connected into a circuit with a polarity that is shown, right? What are the re two readings on the voltmeter when the sliding contact is at end P and we have a sliding contact at end Q? So with potential meters, it's very important for you to be able to understand what is happening in the circuit itself. Change the circuit and connect it in such a way that you can understand it. So we're going to change this in two ways. So the first way is we're going to assume that it's at point Q, right? So this is point Q, and we're going to assume that it is at this particular point, right? So this is bigger. So it at this point Q, then it reaches here. The second one, we're going to assume that it's at that point um, that is here, right? It's now at this point P that is here, right? So this is a voltmeter reading. It's now at point Q, um, which will be here, right? So think about this. This is three volts and this is three volts. In the first case, when it's at P, let's assume that this is a closed loop, right? So we want to assume that this is a closed loop. So this system, right? So let's assume that this is a closed loop on, on its own. And here we'll assume that this is a closed loop again on its own, that whole system, right? So if you were to look at this question, we're given three volts that is here. You have to understand that if there's three volts here and it moves here, then here we need to have three volts. And that three volts will be used in the voltmeter itself, meaning at this end, it will have zero volts. So the total potential difference has to be three minus zero, which is a total of three volts. So the answer has to have three volts when it's at end P, meaning that A and B are wrong, right? If we're to move on this system, this is three volts, right? Very important. This is three volts, meaning that if it's three volts here, it's going to move with that three volts here, right? And when it switches here, it's going... So imagine an electron is leaving here, it's given three bags, it's given three joules of energy, it's going to leave here, it reaches here, it's given another three joules of bags, uh, another three joules of energy or three bags of um of rice so once it passes here it now has six volts it now has six joules of energy right so it reaches here it reaches here once it's here it has six volts but it, it's get used up in the voltmeter remember we've just assumed this is a closed loop applying teacher of second law meaning that this has to be zero volts so this change itself is six volts 
meaning that it now has to be six volts at the end. So the answer becomes D. Very important. So it's very important for you to be able to understand what Keto Flow says and what Keto Flow uh, assumes. Create your own systems, especially the potentiometers. We always have to find different circuits uh, that we can apply. Moving on to question 38. Um, we're given a proton with mass MQ and a discharge E, and we're, we're required to find the mass and charge of an antiproton, right? So antimatter, right, um, is very different. So antimatter is very different from matter, right? Antimatter has the same mass, okay? So it's same mass, but what's different is opposite charge, right? So same mass, same mass, A and B are wrong, but opposite charge, so it becomes D. Move on to question 38. We're given a nucleus with 92 protons, 143 neutrons, right? So let's assume this is U. So the total here will be 92 plus 142. So that is a total of um, 235, and that is 92. And this is a losing, so in terms of alpha particles, it's losing three alpha particles. So in overall, this will be 12. So this will be two times three, which is six, right? And it's also uh, losing four beta particles, right? So this is a beta negative particle, that's zero. And that's, um, um, so beta negative has to be minus four, right? So it's very important. So the nucleus that we're going to form, right? Which is X should have this same charge. So it's 235 here and there's 12 here. So we need to have 223 here, because 235 uh, subtract 12 is 223, meaning that this has to be 223. And we have 92 here. 92 here minus 6 is 86, uh, right? Very important, 86. Meaning that we need 4 more in order for this to be equivalent. So in order, remember, um, for radioactive decay, the proton number conserved, the nuclear, nuclear mass is conserved, and everything else is conserved, um, so the answer becomes D. Moving on to our last question for uh, for today, which is uh, about protons. A proton is a bion, um, or but not a meson. So which of the following is correct? Our proton is a bion, not a meson, right? Very important. So a proton is what we call a hadron because it experiences the strong nuclear force, right? And a bion generally has three quarks, a quark being the most fundamental particle of matter. So if we have three quarks, let's say an up quark, an up quark, and a down quark, that becomes a bion, right? But a meson has only two quarks, an up quark maybe, and an anti-up quark, maybe, and a down quark, okay? So this becomes a meson, right? So we need an anti-down quark. So we have an anti-quark, right? And a quark so two of these will form a meson anti quark and a quark three quarks will form a bion so our answer is a um we're done so um this is the end of our paper so we've been done doing question 11 up until question 14 so uh please like uh share and subscribe um and i'll see you in the next one